I'm the operator with my pocket calculator. Okay. <clears throat> A couple of you will remember seeing this item last year in Trento. Andrea Charlie had this item, this microcalculator, and he showed it. He had on demo, but he couldn't explain how it exactly worked. Um, there was something wrong with it. He just couldn't make it work. He gave it to me at the end of the Friday. Uh, yes, and I had it for the night. So I spent some time with this device and gave it back the following morning. And now found out how it roughly worked. And I went further uh, to find out uh, what's just behind that. So it looks like a zipper, like one of those lighters. Uh, you see the, its sizes, and it was by Andrea Celli. Uh, I haven't had this device in my hands since, since that just last year in Trento. Okay, you have a brief description in last year's proceedings, but that's it. So it, it was to wonder how this thing works. If you open it up, we see a little window. And we see a lens which it's extracted a little bit so that we have a uh, this scale just in focus. We furthermore have an opening on the side, and we'll come back to that later. If you look at it from below, we see two thumb wheels. And these two thumb wheels is one which is red, that's not very much. It's uh, good to be seen, but this is red, and the other one, other one is painted black. That's all we have, and a view from up, up there. If you look through this hole, we see a disc, and we see just there a growth, a notch in here. And uh, this disc moves in here around this central screw. The other side is completely closed. That's all we have. Is this a slide rule? Where does it come from? Well, what is it? Who made it? All those questions you have, and that also this is a slide rule. Well, it comes from Italy. It's a heavy piece. Actually, the whole shell was just made of one piece of metal. Heavy. Yeah, bulletproof. Yeah, so this uh, just uh, gives also already a hint for military use. There are two copies, one owned by Andrea Cialli, and the other one once appeared, and somebody had it. I suppose it was Diesel Camp, uh, uh, and it's in the Rechner Lexicon. But on those pages, the description is simply utterly wrong. It just records that the thing exists, but that's it. <sighs> yes, and what I did, I just researched the thing, and how does it work, and, what is it, and how is it used, and that I will record here. You will not find a description in the proceedings. <sighs> Why? Simply because it just came up with my personal situation. Uh, I couldn't find the time in spring to sit down and write the article. And then I had the other articles uh, coming in, transforming, <coughs> writing the uh, proceedings, making the book. Uh, the plan is to <coughs> uh, publish the, this description in the, Autred, uh, in the Journal of the Autred Society. So you will find it there. So, even if you just start now looking through the pr proceedings, sorry, it's not there. 
Okay, so let's see what we have. We have patents. We can only the there are three of them actually in Italian, a French, a British one. But they are not readable in any way. Um, I think most of you have looked at patents uh, <clears throat> in the past and found out that there is a special language. So if you take, say, English patents, that's not English. It's a kind of patentees. Mm -hmm. It's a very special talk uh, written, or a special language written by lawyers. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in particular in structure and wording. And if you read them in, uh, in a foreign language, that's even worse, but even Andrea could not make heads and tails of the Italian ones. And he had some other problems there also. So we have at least the patents, and those do not tell the whole story. Just say two thirds or three, or say 80% of them, uh, but not the whole story. But what we did find there are two names, uh, uh, namely Marco Abegna and Vincento Aquilecchia. So, who were there? These were professional soldiers in the Italian army. Um, artillery. You see roughly here their, uh, their uh, time of things, of uh, well, birth and death here. You see a similar career, just starting around 1912, 1913, a sub lieutenant in 19, well, accordingly, 1915, 1916, um, uh, making their way through the ranks. And while one actually became brigadier general and teacher at a military academy, and the other one, major general, and he headed a specific uh, lab of the artillery school uh, for computation, and one of them even wrote uh, gunnery tables and uh, uh, trigonometric uh, tables for the, for the army. Yes, so they knew each other that way, and they produced not only this microcalculator, but also another device, which was shown last year in Trento. So that's the background, and we even have here a picture of one of them, uh, and that's all I have right now on the biographic uh, side. There is not much more known. Okay, so let's look at the uh, microcalculator. We see here the drawing from the from the patent. Um, actually, the back side of it is closed, so this does not correspond uh, to uh, the real implementation. We only have that one. This hole here, and it's open. And then we have here some, well, complicated mechanism, which is much, much better explained uh, by this colored uh, drawing by me over here. We have a disk here, that's what we see, with the scales on. So we have this disk with the things. So actually, it's the bottom of things. And then we have the black one, and these are turned by the wheels here, and while the wheel also on the other side for, uh, for the other wheel accordingly. So we have that one here, turned by the, by, the, uh, by the black wheel we have here. So, and we have this gray body in there, and this is a clutch which works by friction. So, if we turn the red wheel, we move this disc, we rotate this red disc freely. The other disc is not affected. But if we turn the black wheel, uh, there's a transmission from the black side, why this clinch, by uh, some kind of friction mechanism, which is by this conic section here. So we have this moved also the red one. Now, what's the essential trick of the thing? The essential trick 
of the whole thing is an inversion. If you use a standard slide rule, like this one, we move that by just moving, oh, that's it that way, moving, yeah, oops, <laughs> yeah, by moving here the slide and the cursor. And we keep the body fixed in this position. We move those. Now the inversion. The inversion is we keep the cursor fixed in one position. And then we shift the body underneath. And with the move of the body, also the slide moves. And that's the idea here with these two disks. Yeah. We also see this in a particular slide rule for, t for teaching for, the, uh, for a projector, which is actually a B-Solar uh, so projector uh, slide rule here, where we have the, in this uh, <coughs> metal frame, we have the cursor fixed and move the slide, or the body and the slide, um, with the fixed cursor. So we have the same thing which we also have with, the, uh, with this projector slide rules, with the same idea uh, implemented in uh, this microcalculator. If you look now through the, through the lens, we see here some scales. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have very good photographs. Just, uh, just these uh, improvised uh, photos taken last year. Unfortunately, I had packed the bags for my wife and for me, and I had packed the camera in her bag. So I didn't have a camera last year with me. So what do we have? We have a log scale, we have a C scale, we have a CI scale, and we have an ST as an entanglement scale. So the classical connection. And just that, what do you need for computing triangles? We have a fixed index line, well, that's just the position here. When you turn uh, the wheel and you see uh, the scale underneath. Yeah. And additionally, we have on the side, oops. No, 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 no. this little hole. And through that hole, oh, sorry, I should have, ah, that's not bad. We should see, yeah, this mark here. And we see this mark, and we can also feel it. When you turn the black wheel, we have a notch uh, going into this growth. So, so you can also feel it. Sorry for this uh, error in sequence. So, uh, and that's uh, what we have, and this gives us some kind of the one position for the black wheel. And can we, is this really a slide rule? Because we only have one set of scales. We don't have several scale, sets of scales which we move next to each other. We have a scale on the body and a scale on the slide. That's what we, what we are accustomed to. How does the whole thing work? Well, I made now a demonstration with a disc, with a gray disc, which is the body, and a yellow disc, which is the slide. So, and the black one is just, well, is the, the gray one is just turned by the black wheel, and the red is the slide with the yellow disc. And the disc position, well, we just see what we have here uh, in the window under the lens, and what we feel with the index mark over here. There's these two marks are a little bit overlaid on there. That's what we see. And now we make two examples. We calculate two by three, very simple. We see, and that's what we see here. We have uh, this little hole, the window, we have this marker, and we have the view here of the yellow disk. And that's what we see in here. This, I just use this, uh, this form, but which simply transforms uh, to the outside 
uh, of uh, the shape uh, in, uh, in the device. So, we first go into the start position. Oh, yes. Brief questions. Please tell me if you just close the slide rule and you just have the classical ones standing over another. So, what do you call this position in English, please? How do you call this position on the slide rule? Huh? Huh? Initial position. Initial position. In the box position. Are you, excuse me? In the box. In the box. <laughs> or is it something like initial position, start position? What? Is there any other anatom for that? Closed. Closed? Aligned. Aligned, okay. Hmm. I just, I'm just using for, I say, our canonical standard term for this position. I haven't found one yet. Nobody knows really. really. Everybody knows it, uh, but uh, nobody could tell me the name for it. Okay. I call it the start position. So, first operation here is we turn the red wheel and put uh, two, the first factor, first operand, on the C scale. So we turn, this, you see this remains here over here, we turn the red wheel, or <coughs> red wheel and we have here the two standing up there. So that's the disk, first operand. And this two corresponds to that segment. Then we use the black wheel and turn the whole thing for getting the free on the CI scale, on the other one. So, we have the two and the three in the other direction. So this is obviously the number six. We only have to read it. So we already have to do the result more or less. How do we get it? Well, we turn the red wheel so that we get uh, the C and CI one under the one to uh, we turn that. So we now have this one here, let me from here to there. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Fine. We have the result. Unfortunately, we cannot read it because it's sitting here, but not over there. And that's why we have those little arrows on, um, <clears throat> on that disk to help us minimize the way we just have to uh, turn the black thumb wheel to uh, get over here uh, where the windows are. So you see here part of those uh, this, uh, little arrows. So uh, we could do the other way around also, but that would be much more work. What we have to do is just get it done by turning now the black wheel, so on, uh, according to the direction of the arrows, until we get to the point that we can see this mark in the little window <coughs> and feel its notch. So, and then we can just read our result six. So even if you have only have one set of scales and a mark for the start position on one of the discs, we have a slide rule. Just a bit complicated. Now, the question is, does this also work for something more difficult? I have here a brief summary. We have six, uh, five steps. Yeah, and we have everything here now in one picture. Okay, can we do it also for something more complicated? Of course, the answer is yes. We take a result value larger than 10. Huh? Four times six. So, what about that? We just do it the same way. Actually, we could skip the very first movement to the start position. 
could do that, but just for clarity and for explanation I include it in here. So we have both again aligned. So we have the four, same as before. We have the uh, six, same as before, but here we see the overlap, turn it around, just for getting uh, <coughs> out to the, well, to the right answer. And now again, I have a question of terminology. In German, when we have a computation, which we first want to do, but the result would be too large, we know that we just have, and the term now here is, die Zunge durchschieben, to shift the slide huh, through the other side. So, what's, bitte, what's place the right British or English term for that? Reset. Because you reset it to the other end of that slide. Right. Well, I would, I, I would reset, I would say, bring it to the start position. Uh, reset because you, you set the index line traditionally from the yeah, right okay. side. You found it off scale, so you reset it to the right hand index line. Any other proposal for that? I never heard hmm. a technical term for that. Hmm? To re well, reverse, I would be uh, putting, <laughs> that would be, would be reversing it. Well, reverse it to get the index. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rod, you had a remark. <laughs> it, was, it was just a question. I, I, just, I, just, I just need some feedback from native speakers what this operation is, is called, so that we establish some standard vocabulary for a couple of those things. If you ever want to write uh, an instruction manual, you just, just have to explain that, uh, and you have to have one definite word. For it. So anyhow, we have this situation here. Yeah, so, and what do we have to do? Well, just work through the same steps as before. So, uh, we have the 24. The 24 is actually just whoops, that way. So, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Actually, that way from here. That's the 24, and you know, know that. So, uh, what do we have here? We have the 24. We just have to pre prepare again uh, the by turning it. Uh, with the red wheel, so that we get this position, again with the ones. And then, we have to apply the same rule with the reading the CI, is bringing it up there from, oops, from here uh, to there. And we can read the 24 up here. Okay, on my uh, implementation here, I have no lettering. Um, in the act on the actual uh, device, we have the lettering over here, uh, so that's not a problem here. Yeah. So, so we see that we actually can do our standard slide rule operations with this device. Yeah, and also the problem to solve with values uh, spanning more than one decade. So, a brief look at the scales. Again, L, C, C, I, S, T, we can multiply those with C, I. That's always this, this pairing with the C, I scale. The division works accordingly. It's just a question of time that I did not here work this out. The uh, trigonometric scales are divided in degrees and minutes. Yeah, so there's not a decimal uh, subdivision, but a classical uh, division here. The question, of course, is what can we actually read here? What are the values? And what are, how were they uh, produced? And what's the scale length if we just want to touch the whole thing? Well, the real scale length is something like 14 and a half centimeter. I just measured that and guessed uh, the size of the inner disk through the window. There's no precise measurement possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, 
that were prepared were a huge drawing, and this was uh, photographed and reduced to size, and the photo paper was glued to the disc. And we see just here the cut. It's not too well done, uh, but uh, uh, that's <coughs> how it works. And we read the whole thing through the lens. And this uh, is a photograph a friend of Andrea Charlie had taken later after we had discussed the whole thing um, and he had uh, analyzed a little, little bit but uh, without result and he sent me this photo and that's all I have. If I make a the question what kind of resolution do we get here in this uh, area just looking at the beginning and in the end of the C scale just C and C I scale yeah? and see what kind of subdivisions I can agree. And I come to a scale resolution readable, something like a 40 centimeter scale. Yeah? Just by looking at the subdivisions, what I can read. Um, and looking now here at the whole thing, what did they do? Well, the goal obviously was yeah, to have such a pocket slide rule with a long scale precision. Something which an officer can take along in the field. And it must be robust, uh, military grade, pocket device. Well, the thing we've seen there actually was, yes, that was uh, quality bulletproof. Yeah. So, one heavy piece. The success, yes, it worked, if it works. Failure, the handling, if I try to do that, was much too complicated. Failure, second, a robot shell is not sufficient. The point is that in the, well, combat situation in the army, you have dirt, you have the question of temperatures and frictions, and the question of maintenance. If you look at it, we have some screws, you have some items that, but main, maintenance of such a thing yeah, is bad. For instance, the hole to read the index line there on the side, it was just open, an opening. There was no cover on it. Maybe there was, and it's lost. But there are two possibilities for a military grade device. First is, to shield it, really to make it a whole closed thing. Yeah? And that means completely. Or you make it conceptually so simple and so reliable, and that's great engineering. Yeah? And to give an example of, well, I suppose the largest, um, say, the largest success in military engineering to make such a device. It's the AK-47. Mr. Kalashnikov constructed a reliable gun which is easy to clean, yeah, which uh, can be produced with low precision tools, but yet work. And it's really now 60 years old. It's the most proliferated weapon on the world, simply because of his basic engineering to have this reliability. And the point is, it's not achieved here. It's neither, not either one or the other. It's a nice uh, attempt, but no, it doesn't work. It has, furthermore, a high price to build. Uh, it's made out of full block uh, and expensive. And I expect that these are prototypes only. On the side, there are serial numbers. With two items known, uh, Rechner, Lexicon, and Shelley, uh, with two different uh, serial numbers, high serial numbers. But that's an old trick. If you want to sell to a government agency, you just uh, claim that you have produced so many of them and I just get the next batch, and this has a high serial number. Yeah? Um, so uh, this is not really a clue. Yeah? This is uh, standard fake technique uh, selling to the government. But in the end, even with uh, those failures, 
uh, it's success that it gives me a nice talk <laughs> here. Yeah. Yes, and that's it. Um, some final thoughts by me. The standard answer is get a better slide rule, which means uh, more precise. Well, make it longer. Yeah, just, but the physical long, there's only one thing. The question is, what kind of resolution do we get in here? What can we read? And how can we read it? So I think, I think we have to think about more about the ergonomics of slide rules. That's a subject which is not much explored until now. Just the ergonomic, how you use them, how to read them. Read them in various conditions, lightnings, etc. So there is another theme, I think, uh, to talk about. Uh, we always find another interesting item. And it's amazingly, very really amazing. Um, well, what kind of different forms um, designs and whatever you, you find in slide rooms. And um, I'm now here with something like 15 to 18 years uh, that I'm interested in slide rules. Uh, and next day, I'm certain I will find another interesting item which is different from all the others I've seen before. And that's a nice thing for our hobby. <laughs> okay. So. A final view, and that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yep, Mark. Was the, the, the system running the, the reserve always in the same place? Mm -hmm. uh, seems something sim similar to the supermarket statement. Mm -hmm. uh, in a round row where the result is always in the same place and under, under uh, yeah. an index. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just how do you, you write the, the result? It's, the, it's, the, it's, the same family. Right? Yeah. yeah it's just, I think the real, uh, the real point is that you have to reverse it from our standard procedure. The standard procedure is grab the body, hold it in your hands, and move the cursor move the slide. And here it is, just yeah, grab the cursor and move the whole thing under it. Huh? And we've seen it in various forms, yes. And what is this? And the reason that uh, on this was not obvious for Andrea Celli is just say this uh, change, of, change of mindset, that's one thing. And the other thing is that this uh, clutch between the two disks of the friction does not work on his properly. Any time you have friction, uh, you have the problem that it either slips or it is too sticky yeah? and moves the other one with it. So he got some results, but those results are not, were not the real ones because this, these two discs slipped a little bit against that and so he got wrong readings. Okay. Yes, Andres. Would it be better to call it a printer rule instead of a slide rule? Printers also have only one set of skills which cannot slide. And the difference between the, in the rotation between the two slides yeah. is like the legs of the pair of compasses. Maybe. Okay. Think about it. So the same principle, yes. Same yes. Principle. Yep. I have two things. One is uh, Werner. That differently Shakespeare's plays. That's uh, the plan for next year. When? Well, it's always sometime in September, at a date very similar to this year, namely 21st and 20, oops, uh, 27th, 20, uh, 22nd of September 2018. So everybody, please uh, take out your calendars, your agendas, and write it down. So. What? Oh. Yeah. So. Uh, and 
again, we have a, uh, we have a theme, and it's, if it's Shakespeare's plays, it has to be something with that, so it's from sonnets to sums. Okay, you know what to do. Everybody, pick out the go to the bookshop, read your Shakespeare again, find good quotes <laughs> to make nice presentations. Yeah. Um, everybody has to do so, so you recognize in the quotes your presentation, please. Um, yeah, very. But this is it's at the Stratford Hotel, and the Brit and the English have also a sort of tradition, namely to make a display that is uh, called out and uh, for people and bring along their specific thing for this uh, theme, for display, and that is early British rules and second theme, long scale rules. So, again, dates we need, a certain uh, uh, a notice to Nintendo paper so that they know what's going on, deadlines and all that. And the important thing is they're really hurried to have those things, everything ready. You can read that all on the website. But first I have to give a warning or an information. First there is this place, Stratford upon Avon, uh, south of Birmingham. That's the place. <coughs> but there are several other Stratfords in Britain. Please, Stratford upon Avon. <laughs> what else is on the, on, the, on the map? There is a place called Milton Keynes, which is actually not meant, but a place nearby. Actually, there's nearby something about here, yes, uh, where we already have been in 2012, namely Bletchley Park. And this is just a reminder of anybody traveling to Britain uh, that they have there the National Museum Computing. And uh, of course, there is also a display by the UK SRC. <coughs> by the UK, a <coughs> uh, slide collect, rule collector. So, go along there, have a look even more, and if you've been there, just a refresher because uh, lots of that is refreshed because many things there belong to Colin Burns and were sold uh, a year ago. So, plan, plan your trip. This is a view of the hotel, and most important is next to the date you wrote. In, uh, in your notes, that you write down this web address, this URL, yeah, you know, UKSRC or UK, you should know that, hmm? and I am 2018.